We are looking at royalty here. Pat Militich in the house. Welcome, my friend. This is exciting. I didn't notice the black belt before. Yeah, how about that? You have a black belt? Uh, in media. Okay. <laughs> I was given uh, it to, uh, to me by uh, Metamoris. Yeah. I think they were trying to well, uh, butter me up. Uh, are, are you offended by it? No, you're a black belt in bullshito. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right off the bat. Has anybody going. ever said that? Hands up. I'm no. not gonna. I'm not gonna mess with you. Don't <laughs> worry. You're 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 on the team now, right? Yeah, what what team is that? Well, the team that's had a little rough water yeah. with certain folks in the MMA world, right? But it's, you, it's okay, though. It's not a big deal. We don't even need to talk around. about that. You've turned it around. You can do it, too. You're I've a got Hall faith of Famer. In you. I've, got, I've got faith in you. How are okay. things these days between Good. you and the UFC? We're fine. We're fine. Yeah. yeah. You feel yeah. the love? Um, you know what? I just do my thing, and I love the sport, and they, they're doing their thing. and So, yeah. I feel like I said this when the... Um, when the Hall of Fame happened, one of the things the UFC has not done well over the years is honoring its past. You know, I'm a big baseball fan, basketball fan. They always bring out the legends. And I thought this year, I don't know if you saw the ceremony, it was different than the one that you were a part of a couple of years ago. They made it a whole night. They had, you know, it was kind of like, a, it felt like its own event. And I think they need to do more of that. The sport right. is so young, but there is such a deep and rich history. There needs to be a physical Hall of Fame. There needs to be more attention to the to the past and honoring people like you, living legends who have helped build this sport. And I'm hopeful that in this new era, they will do more of it. Are you confident that they will, or do you think it will remain the same? I have no idea. And it, honestly, to be honest with you, Ariel, it, I'm not overly concerned with it. Okay. You know, it would be cool for the fans, I think, you know. Um, but as a guy who competed in the sport and coached and does commentary and stuff, I, I, I'm not all that. I'm really not... Like you don't it's, care. No, it's not. It's not. You know, I got in. Dan, the Dan Gable National Wrestling Hall of Fame, um, wrestling and, and fighting Hall of Fame. You know, they've got a lot of pro wrestling in there, collegiate wrestling, Olympic wrestlers, all that sort of stuff. MMA now. You know, getting into that, um, that Hall of Fame to me was really a big okay. deal. You know, Dan Gable was my my lifetime from the time I could you know realize who he was. That was my idol. You know what I mean? So that that meant a lot to me to sit at a at a table and have dinner with Dan Gable and talk to him and you know that that was amazing. That okay. was really amazing to me. All right. Speaking of meaning a lot, um, you actually reached out to me when the whole thing happened a couple of weeks ago, and that meant a lot to me. So thank you very much for yeah, that. It's, you know it's unfortunate that it, that it even happens. You know, to, to be honest with you, I just don't see a reason for it. Um, you know, you're a prof you are you're a professional at what you do. You're very good at what you do. So it's it. When I when I read that, I just went, you know, that's just not that's not cool. It's not cool at all. So, yeah, I feel for you, man. Um, I don't I don't want to um, move forward without asking you. I, feel, I have to ask you about Matt Hughes. Mm -hmm. Do you have an update on how he's doing? Well, you know what I can say. You know, the the family is pretty guarded in, in what's going on, obviously. Okay. But I can tell you that he's he is surprising the doctors. Okay. You know, he's he's um, making great leaps and and he is. Uh, no longer in a coma, and he's that is he's, great. He's improving. Okay, uh, you know it's going to be a long road. Okay, any any kind of head trauma at that level, uh, there's going to be some rehab. So, have you been able to visit him? Nobody's allowed to visit him that I know of, besides you know family. That's that's it. Okay, right now they just don't want to overload him. Yeah, you know they want his his energy to go to healing. You know, not to anything else. So, do they yeah. think he might make a full recovery? I'm I'm 100% sure he's going to make a, a full recovery. Wow. To be honest with that you, is I mean, tremendous. for for the injuries that that uh, he sustained, you know, I just saw a documentary a few weeks back of people that worked with the the people that Matt sits on a board of directors for a charity for head trauma. Okay, and they had no idea that, and they were offering their services also. Huh. And the, the head of that group said, you know, when we asked Matt to step on board and when he was donating money to us and everything, we had no idea five years ago that we'd end up potentially yeah. helping him and treating him. And, uh, you know, so they did a video, though, a, an amazing documentary on a girl that was a barrel racer, and her vehicle got hit by a train. It's crazy, but I watched this little documentary, and she went from... You know, not being able to talk, not being able to walk, everything else to she's back to barrel racing and things like that. So it's, wow. it's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and do you know what happened? Like, what? Um, from from reading about what the the head of the locomotive, um, the engineer said, is that uh, Matt had stopped on the gravel road. It's a hill going up to the uh, a, a real quick hill that goes up to the railroad tracks. He had stopped and then tried to get across in time, and the train was going almost 50 miles an hour, and you're out there in the middle of the country, there's no crossing uh. guards, there's no lights, there's none of that, but it was almost like he saw it, and then tried to beat it, and what 
what uh, I would say is that, you know, you're on a gravel, gravel road out in the country on a hill and you try and punch it and get over, you're gonna spin your tires, things like that. And, okay. and didn't get across in time and, and got clipped on the passenger side. But, um, you know, anybody that lives in the Midwest, you don't, I grew up in the Midwest, and you see a, it was a coal train. And when you have to sit for a coal train, you're there for a long time. Oh, really? The coal train is, you know, five miles long. Oh, wow, wow. So they just go forever. And so he probably went, oh, that's a coal train, I gotta get out of here, I gotta okay. get across, so. Well, we wish him the best, and Thanks. we'll continue to pull for him 100%. What brings you to New York? Uh, I'm here doing media um, events and, and interviews with different different media folks for the Mayweather-McGregor fight. So For Showtime? Yes, yes. Are you going to be a part of that broadcast? I am. Access TV was kind enough to let me. Uh, they loaned me out wow. for that show, which was really cool of them. I Amazing. Mean, um, the folks at that Access are great. and you know, obviously, I used to work for for Showtime also, so I'm very familiar with with my family over there. And so, yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be a great uh, great event. Big, you know, everybody. I think it's tough to argue that it's 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 certainly the biggest combat sporting event ever in the history of. I mean, this is you think about um, Thriller and Manila and Foreman Frazier and and guys like uh, you know, I mean uh, Ali and and Frazier and Foreman, all those guys. I mean, this is going to rival, if not beat that. Yes, it's huge. And what will you be doing on the broadcast? You know, they haven't actually told me exactly. Okay. But I'll, most likely I'll be sitting at the desk off in the distance, you okay. know, breaking down the fight, how things are going to go. You won't be in the booth, so to speak? I don't know. You and Morrow together again? That would be fun. Yeah. I'd love to harass him. Yeah. I'd love to harass him. But. I think it would be cool to have an MMA guy, you know, like Paulie's there, and I think he's fantastic. Right. But, you know, you representing the MMA community and your background, you have a boxing background as well, yeah, so I think you have an appreciation I, for it. I, I did a little boxing, did more exhibition fights with pro boxers than anything, but I spent years and years sparring with really high level boxers. And, and um, you know, they were a big part of me being able to get into, you know, the MMA cage and not get beat up, you know. Are you surprised that the UFC let this happen? No, because, I mean, they're gonna get their cut, right? Yeah. And it, it certainly helps. I mean, you think they're rolling the dice, right? If McGregor pulls off that upset, you realize how big that is for MMA. That's a gigantic. Gigantic. It really is. And But I, I I try to tell people, you know, I'm a combat sports fan. I love boxing, I love judo, I love wrestling, I love this, I love that. I love it all, um, all the different forms of, of combat sports. So it's not, a, to me, it's not about being a boxing fan or an MMA fan or or anything. Or I don't want to be a purist. I, you know, the, all these forms of combat have something to offer to me, and it's it's humans out there testing each other spiritually, physically, and, and mentally against each other, and it's it's very cool. You know. Do you think he has a chance? Well, I would say this. You know, the the typical talking points that you're going to hear from every Joe Schmo um, is he's bigger, he's younger, he's lefty, he's this, he's that. Um, I think he's got a good chin. I think he's got got a chance to survive against against Mayweather. I think he can stick around. Mayweather hasn't knocked anybody out in 10 years legitimately, which says something. Mayweather, at the same time, though, is protecting himself, doesn't want to end up a punch-drunk guy, and uh, wants, to, wants to enjoy his money. I mean, that's his style of fighting. Great defense, and when you don't put yourself out on a limb, it's easy to have great defense. It's like, if I don't try to take you down and you're a good wrestler, it's gonna be tough for you to, to take me down because I'm all about defense. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So Mayweather's been great at scoring points, staying ahead on the cards, and just coasting to victories. You know, and, and that's something that he's done. Will Will McGregor pull him out of that and make him go out on a limb to try and knock him out? Possibly. So that's that's the thing. But um, McGregor's got a good enough chin. I think he can hang around, and and that means he's there for twelve rounds with that monstrous left hand. And I, you know, it doesn't matter who you are if you're that weight and you get hit with that hand. It's it's going to hurt you. You know, it's it's definitely got the potential for him to to pull off the biggest upset in, in combat sports history, and certainly, uh, actually, sports history. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Although the odds wouldn't reflect that. Now he's a four to one underdog, which is somewhat a of, shocking. A lot of people want to want to throw money at That's him. right. Yeah. Do you enjoy watching Floyd box? I do. I, love, do. I love watching him box, yeah. Why? I'm a fan of his boxing, not of his personal life, sure. obviously. Nobody really is, probably. Um, look, he uh, he makes people miss. It's It's beautiful to watch. I mean, he can see everything coming before it comes, and... Uh, can read read the body. He can see what's coming. He can see him loading. He can even fighters that don't load that can throw the, with no negative movement at all. He's already gone most of the time. You know, besides a, a Maidana type guy who's just a nut job throwing stuff from everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gonna be tough to see that coming. But um, no, I love I, I love watching. I mean, I loved watching Roy Jones fight. Roy Jones was a scarier version version of Mayweather in my mind because he had the power to put people away. Right. 
do you subscribe to the notion that even if Connor loses, but it goes the distance, he kind of wins? I absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. I I mean that's. Chalk one up for MMA. Yeah, because I kind of feel like all the pressure is on Floyd here because every day people are coming up to him saying, you're going to smoke this guy. He doesn't deserve to be in there. So you actually have to validate that and do something spectacular. If it's your typical Floyd fight where he skunks you, but it goes the distance, yeah. then what are we... The same. Right? It's not the same at all. That, it's one thing to do that against Canelo. It's another to do that against a debutante. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no, buddy. Yeah. So do you feel like that's going to make him fight outside of his comfort zone and try to do something spectacular when that's not his style? That's uh, that's what I'm betting on, to be honest with you. Interesting. I think he tries to drag him into deep water, get him tired, and then put him away, yeah. I feel like people have obviously not had success boxing him, clearly. I mean, 49-0, greatest defensive boxer. If you And and I don't know if you saw Pauly Malignaggi's comments. Um, he sparred with him, I think it was on Thursday. With McGregor. Yeah, with McGregor. I feel like if you attack Floyd as an MMA fighter and just completely redefine how you box this guy, and you almost do it in the most unconventional way possible, maybe there's a chance there. If you come at, the thing about Floyd, in my opinion, is he is going, he figures you out very quickly. Mm -hmm. So so you really have to do your damage like in the first four rounds or so, right? But Connor's gonna go out there so unconventional that it's going to sort of confuse him, and that's when he's going to be able to strike you know, his best. You feel like you almost have to, go, you have to almost redefine. If, if Connor tries to learn how to box Floyd in the next month, it's not going to happen. It's, he right. can't. So do something completely different. Yeah. Uh, Would you advise him of that? Well, I mean, in the guys that I've sparred with who are world class boxers and world champion boxers, sparring them like an MMA guy doesn't work. Yeah. You get, you get, you get, you get the hell beat out of you. Okay. So uh, you can't even do that. You can't even do that. Okay. No. I mean, for, for, for me, in my mindset, if I'm going into a fight, like this with a guy that's that good, I've got to take him into anaerobic territory because boxers are not anaerobic, anaerobic animals. Um, a boxer is an aerobic animal. It's like running, right? Uh -huh. Wrestling is completely anaerobic. So the more he can put his hands on him, push down on his, on his forearms, um, just off balance him, block a leg here, push with your head off balance him, crack him, just turn it into a rough and tumble anaerobic type existence, that's when Mayweather will get tired. That's when he'll get fatigued. So you can't you can't go out and box with a boxer. He's not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just can't. So it's I think, you know, and I tell people and people look at me like, really dude? Um, but I'm training a fighter that's going into that fight to cheat within the rules the entire fight. Interesting. Literally. Okay. To, Push the it, limits. It's gotta be literally that close to a street fight. Okay. It has to be. And get Two warnings for everything you could possibly do <laughs> before a point. Uh, and it, look, if you if you get a point taken, you get a point taken. It's not going to win on the cards anyway. That's true, right? And I'm just being honest. So, what are some things that he can do? Like, what are some tricks? Well, like I say, the the constant pressure of of look, you know, the the the, the tap to the back of the head and the push on the hip at the same time to make the head pop back to throw stuff. Um, you know, the bringing the head through and throwing a, a lead hook, which would be opposite side for him stuff like that but like i say blocking a leg on on when he gets him against the ropes because of their same stance lead legs forward clashing block the outside of the leg push with your head off balance and you know take the leg out from under and make him stumble make him lose his balance and unload on him a lot of different stuff like that to get people um off balance you know and, and that's that's the thing and he's got to go at the same time mayweather goes he cannot counter by getting out of the way and then throwing back. It's Why is that? Work. Mayweather's gone. Too quick. You have to go at the exact same time he throws. So Connor is typically known as a counter puncher. He has to change that attack, right? Well, and, and truly to be a counter puncher, in my mind, you have to be an aggressor somewhat. I've, yes. got to, I've got to pull technique out of you. Yeah. So I've got to at least faint or crack you with something to get you to throw back and get out of the way and then come back and hit you, right? Uh -huh. So that's... He's going to have to be a leadoff fighter to a certain extent to get to get that to happen. And both guys are going to have to do that. And he's got to he's got to have convincing feints and fakes, the same mechanics as a real punch that aren't being thrown. You know what I mean? That's where boxers are so much better than most MMA guys is the the feints and the fakes of really really tricking people into thinking something's coming and they're countering something that doesn't exist, and then opening themselves up. So he's got to be able to. If if I've got a guy who's good at feints and fakes and he's making me flinch. If I don't get him out of that rhythm and start doing the same thing to him and playing that mind game with him, I'm done. I'm just, I'm, it doesn't matter who it is, I'm, I'm gonna get myself in trouble, so. Do you think his team is making a mistake by not bringing in any you know, straight up boxing coaches? It's the same team that he has around him, essentially. I mean, he's bringing in some boxers to spar with, obviously, but as far as his corner and all that, it's it's the same group of guys. You know, I look, there's a lot of guys out there in the boxing world with massive amounts of knowledge, obviously, that, that would help him. But I think his his coach, um, his striking coach, has done a good job with him, obviously. Yeah, Owen Roddy. Uh, maybe, maybe not gotten him, obviously, to, you know, 
world title, being able to go through and destroy, you know, Triple G and all these guys, Canelo and everybody else uh, on a consistent basis. But he's done a great job with it. Um, so I, th I think he's fine there. It w truly comes down to having great training partners, great okay. sparring. Um, that's what gets the reaction time. You know, that's when you pay a price for making a mistake. And getting slapped on the side of the head with a mitt doesn't teach you a lesson. Getting right. cracked by a great boxer, you know, makes you go, I can't do that again because that hurts, right? I still feel like people don't give Connor his due. Like there are still some people who say, oh, he never fought this guy, he never fought that guy. He's getting more, but some are still reluctant to give him his props. Where do you fall on the Connor debate? Like, are you a fan of his? Do you appreciate what he's done? Or do you still, do you feel like the jury's still out on him? The USC has put him in some, you know, good positions to make history and things like that. Look, no matter what anybody says, the stars have aligned, right? Yeah. For him, and I, I think that anybody who's gone down the path of, of being a professional fighter and, and, and that, I'm including myself in it. You have to fool yourself that you can be great, right? To win a world title to begin with and to hold on to a title, you have to convince yourself that you can do it. You have to dream it, visualize it nonstop, and see it happening before it can ever happen. So he's already convinced himself of that level, and he's also convinced himself that he can climb in a boxing ring with Floyd Mayweather. Mm -hmm. um, a guy with that much mind power, and I was just saying it uh, earlier today, you know, to give you an example of a guy with great mind power, my running coach, David Clark, who is, um, started out a 320 pound guy who now runs ultra marathons like they're nothing. He ran the Badwater in Death Valley, which 128 degrees, 135 miles, who hallucinated for eight hours of that race, arguing with the white line on the highway uh, because it was telling him he wasn't a world-class runner and he couldn't finish. Um, you know, it grew a mouth and was talking to him. Wow. It had a name. And you have to run on the white line in Death Valley in that race so that your shoes don't delaminate and come apart. Wow. So for eight hours of that race, which I think it's a, I forget the cutoff on that race, but 135 miles through Death Valley and then 10,000 feet up into the mountains, people don't even remotely understand how, how monumental it is to even get into that race, let alone finish it. Um, you know, that's mind power. And that's the kind of mind power I see with a guy like Conor McGregor, who's just 100% convinced himself that he belongs there and he can do it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have become a champ. He wouldn't. And sure, uh, maybe did he dodge some bullets, but hey, he had two wars with Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is an incredible fighter, no matter what anybody thinks. Um, so look, I think it's, the fact he pulled it off is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's monumental. <laughs> it's that he, that it's he a victory it. in its own right. Because I was in negotiation, sat in a negotiation room in Hollywood, California with Winky Wright in his camp. And we were trying to get a fight put together between he and I. Um, it didn't work out. Uh, this was after the UFC, right? Mm -hmm. And why didn't it work out? Uh, somebody in, uh, from his side of the camp that kind of brought everything together um, decided that he deserved more of a cut of, of the whole thing and negotiations fell apart. The uh, breakdown? What was the breakdown? Well, the, the money part's not important. It's oh. just this guy suddenly decided to be greedy and he was, said he was going to file lawsuits. and all Really? That and How all close that. were you? What's that? How close were you? Oh, we were going to do it. Really? I mean, they were going to turn it into a reality show. They were going to do it. Wow. This is, you know, years ago, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, Roy Jones and I had talked a little bit about doing the same thing, but it was going to be an MMA fight. And Roy said, as long as you agree to stand up with me for the first five minutes, then you can do anything you want after that. What? And he was, and Roy was obviously Roy. Yeah. So he was gambling that he was going to knock me out in the first five minutes, which, dude, do I want to get hit by Roy Jones? No, I don't. But uh, then he took the fight in Australia. He said, I got to go do this fight in Australia first. Yeah. He got knocked out and yeah. derailed all that. So the oh, stars did not man. align. The stars did not align. And, but these guys are much bigger names. I mean, not than, than Roy Jones or anything, but McGregor, obviously a bigger name than I ever was. Um, I was never close to that. So uh, it's, it's awesome. The fact he, because I've been down that road, I know how massive uh, of an undertaking it was to try and get it done. And he's done it. How much, would you have made the most amount of money of your career if you got one of those two boxing well, matches? By, yeah, well, yeah, by far. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't even make sense. Because you would have been, your, you didn't have any promotional ties to anyone else or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Damn. But it is what it is, right? That's you think why. about, you, th you don't think about it? You don't lament it? The only time I've thought about it is this, this right trip now. when people oh, are asking. People are asking, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember that. that. That was probably like a decade ago now, right? Mm -hmm. When there were rumors of that. Yeah. Um, why were you so interested in doing this? Why did you want to test yourself against two of the best? I mean, Look, no matter what, whether I were to win or to lose, okay, I, I, I fought Roy Jones. I yeah. Winky, right? it's, it's an incredible experience in life, right? Right. I mean, it's, I look back and go, I totally forgot that I fought Dan Severn to a draw. Hmm. And, um, you know, you'll think back and go, I fought Dan Severn. I guess 
It's not easy. Yeah. You know I mean, it was a big dude. Sure, sure. You know, when he was young. So, um, yeah, it was just, it's an accomplishment, right? It's just something, challenge yourself, do whatever you got to do. And um, that's why I'm dumb enough to do a 100-mile race this August again. 100 miles? Yeah. Running? Yeah. Damn. And it's a race? It's called the Leadville 100, yeah. Where's that? Leadville, Colorado. Okay. Yeah, through the Colorado Rockies. So. Is it in August? August 19th. Saturday, well, August 19th. So a week before. Mm -hmm. And what kind of training is involved? Um, a lot of running, obviously. A lot of running. But a, yes. lot of, a lot of incline training because you're going over mountains and things yeah. like that. Um, Why are you doing this? You know, I, I, some some friends of mine from, from Iowa, um, John Byrne, who's a professor at a local college, had trained with me in martial arts and decided one day he walked up to me and he goes, man, thanks for everything you've done for me. I love it. He goes, man, I'm going to try this thing called the Leadville 100. And I said, what's that? And he told me, and I went, holy cow. All right, go, go for it. And he had done it twice since then. Oh. And he was doing it again last year. And I said, you know what? I got to figure something out with my body because my body wasn't right. Something was wrong. And I figured if I, if I set a goal like that, something crazy, I, I could pull my body out of the gutter. And um, through that training and the torture, I realized that I had something wrong with me and I got blood tests, found out I was gluten intolerant. Oh. I had arthritis, breathing problems, digestive problems. I mean, it was, it was bad. I mean, it was a lot heavier than I am now. And uh, figured that out, stopped eating wheat and soy and, and my body healed up and I was able to start doing wow. something. I got to, a, my longest run so far is 75 miles. So I did not finish it last year, I got hurt. Okay, uh, what happened? I'm a clumsy son of a, you know. Yeah. I, I, uh, I fell. And as I was falling, I tripped and tried to catch myself and came down on uneven ground and uh, popped my calf and my knee. And oh, no. So I made it. That was a, literally eight miles into the thing. Uh. So I made it to the 24-mile cutoff where they kicked me out uh, for being gimpy. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that was last year? Yeah, last year. And now you're doing it again. Yeah, I figured, you know what, I'll go back and try it again. And there's people that have done it. You know, like my, uh, David Clark, my running coach, goes, dude, he goes, you realize there's a lot of people who have tried that who have never finished. It's like a 45% finishing rate, and everybody's way better runner than I am. It's just my brother's doing it with me this year, and then uh, my friend John Burns going back also and doing it. But um, it's, I think it's the coolest sport I've ever seen in my life. Running. The, this is not running. This is um, an internal journey that people take that get over this 100-mile or, or greater uh, runs even a 50 miler is tough. Yeah, I mean, it can be brutal. Sure, um, but uh, you know, he's John Byrne last year at the 50 mile mark after he'd gone over Hope Pass, which is almost 13,000 feet high, um, came down to the 50 mile mark and was hallucinating, had caloric deficit, dehydrated, um, altitude sickness, everything. Couldn't even form a sentence. Had no clue. Literally, probably couldn't even tell you his name at the time. We were dumping bullion in him, watermelon with salt, just anything we could get in him to rehydrate him and get him going, and get his electrolytes back. And after he, he had to go back over that same mountain, which I'm telling you, when you look at that mountain at the 50 mile mark, you realize how, how massive of an undertaking it is. And I saw him at the 60 mile mark when he got back and he was brand new. He recovered while going over a mountain. Wow. Was, so like, you, you know that you're going to go through hell and you're doing this willingly. Like this might happen to you as well. You're okay with that? Well, I mean, during a 50 mile run last year in the heat in late June, I think it was, early July, um, I, I heat stroked for probably three, four hours. Oh my. Run. It was it was pretty, and the rest of them were actually laughing at me. What? They Your were, friends? Yeah, they were laughing at me, yeah. Some friends. It's just, well, that's what fighters do, right? <laughs> that's true, like yeah. The first time I got dropped with a liver shot by Jeremy Horn, he ran around the room high-fiving Hughes and Pulver. Yeah, and all, yeah, yeah. And all laughing at me, right? But. It's the same mentality, right? How old are you now? Uh, 50. 50. 50. Wow. That is amazing. And so what are you doing day to day? I mean, I know you still work for Axis, right? Um, you're calling, I mean, you were, you were just a couple of days ago, right? Yeah. Weren't you? I mean, LFA, the, 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 I mean, it's a pretty rigorous schedule. I mean, About are you? 40, or what are we at? 42 or 43 shows this year. Yeah. Wow. A lot of flying. Yeah. Of flying, but. Uh, you enjoy it? I do. I love it. Okay. I love working at Axis. They're great people. You lost your partner. He moved Michael back Chevella. to Australia. You know, right. Hats off to him for for making that move on his own, you know, on his own terms, went back, wanted to take his family back and raise the, raise the kids in Australia, which is, you know, awesome. Um, he and I became very close over seven years of broadcasting. Yeah, of together. course. And, uh, you know, now Ron Kruk has replaced him. And I've worked with Ron before when, when Michael was taking vacations right. and stuff. So it's, it's awesome. I love, uh, I love working with, with Ron and all the people from, from Access, the people in the, the crew, you know, they're, they truly are. They're good people. We'll do workouts together. Okay. You know, Thursday and Fridays, we're working out, doing a bunch of stuff. We'll go do trail runs. We'll hike up a 14,000-foot mountain in Colorado. Wow. Um, 
because they're from Denver. Yeah. So those guys are they're they're they have that mindset. Yeah. You know, so it's a lot of fun working with those guys. So other than the TV work, which obviously takes some time with the travel, what else are you doing day to day these days? Well, I still have a law enforcement military training company called okay. Fire Horse Combatives, and then I do a podcast called The Conspiracy Farm. I have seen this. I was going to ask you about that. There's a, you know, there's a lot of people that that are traumatized by, by some of the guests we have on and some of the things we talk about. Traumatized? Oh, yeah. It's, what do you mean? It's, there, well, there's a lot of stuff out there that people are never told by the mainstream media, and I'm just, you know, we just let it, we let it go. We let are it you a big conspiracy guy? Well, here's the thing. Um, a conspiracy is when two or more people are conspiring to do something behind yeah. closed doors. Sure. Right? Um, so the, the thought of conspiracy where people are wearing tinfoil hats and all this stuff, look, the stuff actually goes on. Okay. You know what I mean? So, you know, not to get off on a tangent, but people can just, we'll just say this one thing. People can do a Google search on Silkway Airlines and 17,000 flight manifests of small arms all the way up to depleted uranium um, artillery rounds that are being shipped into places like the stands in Chechnya and North Africa into Syria and places like that. And uh, why, why is that not talked about in, in our mainstream news, right? W how are all these weapons, these very dangerous weapons, 17,000 cargo planes, flights full of weapons into different parts of the world, wherever there's a conflict that needs to happen, these weapons seem to turn up. Huh. That's all I'm saying. That's all. So why do you think? Do that. What's that? Why do you think? Why is it not being talked about? Well, you know, the media, who, who you know, I, look, you work for, you work for a big monstrous uh, not network that. here. I'm yeah. not <laughs> part of it at all, and they're not probably. But no, I'm just saying that, that people are given teleprompters to, to read off. Sure, sure. Right? I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying that there are things that are happening that should be happening. Okay. That's what I'm saying. How do you and feel? it's on both sides of the aisle politically. Right. Both sides of the aisle. I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I'm not a big political guy. Right. Um, I am Canadian. As you can see here, right. but I do live in the United States. Yeah. How do you feel about the state of the country right now, just out of curiosity? Um, I think I think the country's in a little bit of uh, um, a little bit of trouble, to be honest with okay. you. The, the fact that people are so polarized, it shouldn't be that way. Look, on our podcast, we're equal opportunity roasters. We go after Republicans and Democrats. If there's corruption, we, we go after them, and that's just the way it yeah. is. Um, we're probably not well liked by some by some folks, but. Quite frankly, I, I you don't I'm care. not looking for people's approval. <laughs> for people's approval, it's just not not something I've I've sought in life. So uh, we just try to have guests on that are that are very informed, that are experts in what they're talking about, and and uh, you know they've got the documentation to prove it, and, and that's that's where we go. How did you get involved in this? It's like you and four, I think four or three other people, and it's myself and my co-host Jeffrey Wilson. Yeah, okay. Um, we we started it together. He hosts a podcast. He's, he's down in St. Louis right now. He's from my area originally. Okay. He's going to be moving back so that we can do a, an in-studio show Okay. Uh, because it's growing quite a bit. It's get, getting a lot of attention. Um, but uh, when I was about six years old, I was standing in line in Albia, Iowa uh, with my grandmother and my mother. And I remember this to, perfectly. And it was when the farm collapse happened and Nixon took us off the gold standard. Okay. Right? When we switched to the petrodollar. Okay. Which nobody talks about either. Um, and all the bankers were in line down the street and around the block to all the farmers from the, the surrounding area were there to get their money out before the bank collapsed because of the, the rush. There was a rush on the banks. And uh, we were in line early, but I, w I remember asking my grandma and my mom why we were there. And they were trying to explain what was going on and that they had to get their money out and this and that. And I think from then on, I was just keen to things that were going on that 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 one move by a group of bankers could destroy so many lives and make the farms implode and people have to auction their farms off and things like that. And, and from then on, I've just been that way. I just don't, without verifying, I don't fully believe what I'm hearing. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So that's just the way I've always been. Do you enjoy talking about this now at this point in your life than say combat sports? Do you, is it a I'm different kind of run? I'm passionate about it. Okay. I'll just say that. You know, for me, I can call a fight Pretty easily, I think just from all the years of fighting and all the years of coaching, I had to spit information out to fighters fast during a fight. You know, that's got to be very fast yeah. when things are happening that quick. So, I think that that helps me in, in maybe informing people at home of what's going on, why things are happening. You know, um, and David Dinkins from Showtime was the one that said, "You're the why guy." You know, when I first started broadcasting for Showtime, he was very good about coaching me and said, "You know, you're the why guy. Tell people why it's happening. Don't don't show a replay and go." Oh, there's a big right hand by by Jim Smith. 
how did he land it? Okay. Why did he land it? What did the other guy do wrong? Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's pretty easy for me to call combat sports, the the geopolitical and domestic stuff. I'm I'm just I'm keen to, and I and I like to pique other people's interest in it because obviously I have children and they're going to grow up in this country. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like for people to actually you know have a say. Have you have you tackled the JFK assassination yet? My partner, that's where he started his, oh, that was his run whole down the rabbit hole. Wow. When he was 17 years old and and he knows more about it than I I literally know nothing. Really you're not interested it. in that. I I am. I am interested in it. I was just there. That's why we were, we were in Dallas. there was a fight in Dallas, in Dallas yeah. so I went to visit it and I was just blown away there's a guy standing there on a mic. Have you been? I've, I've, yes, I've been to And Dallas. he's telling his whole story about the conspiracy and the multiple shooters and it, like literally right there. And then yeah. there's the museum and the whole scene was just, it was kind of numbing. I mean, right, it was, right. and you see the X on the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you believe that there were multiple? I don't necessarily believe um, in terms of shooters, numbers of shooters. Um, I, I believe that, that Kennedy, when you listen to his speeches, was against the machine. Um, he was definitely against the globalists, okay. and I think that there was a, a very good reason for taking him out. Let's put it that way. We had, we had Lee Harvey Oswald's mistress from the CIA on, and she's got all this stuff documented. Blow your mind on your show on our on our what? podcast. Yeah, that's crazy. So she <laughs> listen to Lee that. Harvey Oswald's mistress, and wait, 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 was a scientist for the CIA. What? She got taken from high school. She went straight into the CIA. Okay, because she figured out in high school how to pull magnesium out of seawater or something okay. crazy, right? And she's got all this documented, all this stuff she's got. She kept all the documentation of her work in the CIA and the, the scientists she was working under. Um, and she um, said that Lee Harvey Oswald and her were, were, were seeing each other. And Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald had been to Russia. He had been sent to Russia to go to school, things like that. And he didn't go over there just um, on his own whim. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was told to go there and go to college. Got back, and he said, I've been set up. He goes, I can't stop it. I literally cannot. And this is her saying, this is his panicked conversation with her. Whatever it is they're doing, now I know they've set me up. I'm, I'm already, I'm, I'm done. I'm cooked. I'm a communist. They're, they're already setting me up to be a communist. I'm 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 done. And wow! It was it was like they framed him. Now I'm not saying that's true. Okay. <laughs> but I'm saying that there's a lot of weird stuff. Sure, sure. With it, and uh, but her here's the crazy thing about her, is they told her when she, when she got hired, um, your job is to figure out how to give uh, lab rats lung cancer in a week. You've got to be able from the time you treat them, they need it. They Jeez. need to actually have lung cancer in a week. She figured it out, right? How to uh -huh, do it. Uh huh. And then she found out why they were having to do that, because they were going to put that stuff, whatever she developed, into Fidel Castro's uh, oh my. cigars so that he would get lung cancer. Oh, my gosh. Right? And she's, and, and I can't even remember her name offhand now, but she was one of our first guests. But amazing, amazing to listen to her. Where can people see the show or listen um, to the podcast? They can listen to the show on iTunes. and It's on, it's on YouTube too, right? Yes, it's on, on YouTube, yeah, called The Conspiracy Farm. All right, wow, that is wild. Do you still watch MMA? I mean, are you a fan? Do you I do. I do it. I watch it when it's a, you know, what I would deem, I guess, a, a big fight. How do you feel about the state of the sport right now? Um, the state of the sport overall, I think, could use some, some competition, uh -huh. quite frankly. I think so. Do you like what Bellator is doing, signing free agents, getting a little more aggressive? I do. I would like to see Viacom, and I, it looks like they're they're giving Scott Coker a little more leeway. Yeah. And some of the stuff he's doing. Look, Coker's a dangerous guy. That guy can run a business. Yeah. He's very good at what he does. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, at least there's two major organizations, if not, you know, with, with one over in, in Asia, you know, if they can keep growing and, and start pulling guys away. So that, you know, I want the athletes to be able to, to have people bid for them, for their service. There was a time like two years ago where Coker was saying that you were hitting him up to fight. Was that true? It, it was, it was um, while I was training for the last Leadville. Okay. So. Are you still interested in fighting? I would, yeah, something like a Hoist Gracie fight, something like Hanzo that. Hanzo Gracie, I think, just came out recently and said he's still interested. Is he? Yeah. I wouldn't mind getting that one back. Yeah. yeah. I had a really bad neck in that one, and, and he's really good at choking people. Yes. <laughs> so this is something you still kind of dabble so, with? No, I mean, I look, um, the training I'm doing now running long distances is far harder than training for a fight. Okay. It's just not, it's not even close. It's, it's really not, Ariel. Um, sure, you get bumps and bruises training for fights and things like that, but you know, a, a 20 minute, 20 minute, 25 minute uh, world title fight, the pain that you go through or the fatigue you go through is nothing compared to running while the sun's up 
and then the sun goes down and you're still running and then the sun comes up again and you're still running and it's that, that's a different level of sure sure it's a, it's a totally different level of pain so i really don't have have any problem you know if it's the right person absolutely I'd, wow yeah. um does anyone still come up to you and say hey would you would you coach me would you corner me would you yeah train i do me? i do get inquiries a lot i still get messages people you know asking yeah i bet that and stuff and you know i've i i don't know it might have been was it you i talked to about my conversation with brian stan uh, no in the back of a car we were leaving espn we had done the show together it was the last show you know several years back mma live yeah where yeah. i i for three years i had struggled that i wanted to get out of coaching i just had too much going on i had okay. i had the gym i was coaching I had my law enforcement military training company. I was working for three TV networks, ESPN, Showtime, and Access TV. And it, my life was just, it was overwhelming. Yeah. Feast or famine type thing. And, and I was, it was a feast and it was out of control for several years there. And I, I just, I was losing my mind. I wasn't seeing my kids ever, anything like that. Yeah. And we got in the, it was the last show before the Christmas break. And I had two or three weeks off, I think. And I, I, um, was on the phone with my daughters and I hung up with them. I said, I love you, I'll make you breakfast in the morning and, and hung up. And he goes, I've got two daughters too. And he goes, you know what? And then he looked at me and you gotta remember, this is a guy, I'm looking at him with the mindset of, I gotta get out of coaching. It's just, there's too much going on. And he looks at me and he goes, you know, Pat, he goes, I've killed a lot of people. And he goes, and after, after or during each firefight that I was in with, with explosions going off and bullets bouncing off Hesky and rocks and stuff around me. Um, I wondered what the meaning of life was every single time. And he goes, I finally came to the conclusion that the greatest thing a man could ever do is raise his kids the right way and get them off on the right foot. And I just looked at him and went, I'm done. That's it. That moment I quit. And when I got back to Iowa, uh, wow. I went on vacation to Florida with my family. I basically said, I'm done. When, when, after Christmas break and all that, I'm not going to be here. Wow. I'm, I'm done. That's it. And that's when you... Find a different coach. Wow. I'm done. And, and has anyone come to you and you were like, ah, this, 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 this is a project here. This is someone that I... And you, or... you know, um, Ted from Team Takedown years back... Yep, I remember. Offered, offered me Ted Earhart. a job down there. Yep. And I said, Ted, you don't have the money. Okay. You're a millionaire, but you don't have the money. Trust me. Okay. Do it again. No. Wow. It would have to be a massive amount of money to get me to coach again. So I'm assuming you still keep tabs on Robbie Lawler. Mm -hmm. That absolutely. is your guy. Absolutely. He's right. fighting this weekend. Did you know that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's fighting Donald Cerrone. You yeah, like this and, matchup? Um, look, Donald Cerrone's a dangerous guy. Yeah. He, he's proven to be dangerous over and over again. What does Rob gain by beating him? Ah. Uh, right? Yeah. If I'm Rob's manager, I would have never let that fight happen. Interesting. Not saying that, that Robbie's going to get beat by him, but it's just... Look, Cerrone's a dangerous, dangerous dude. Yeah. He hits hard, he kicks hard, he, he's versatile, he's great on the ground. Um, the guy is no joke. He's, he's world class, and he has been for years. So um, if, if they would have said, you know, these, these, are, your, these are your choices, uh, Cer take Cerrone off that list right now. Huh. That's a, that's a no-win situation. Why do you take it? Robbie will fight anyone. Yeah. It's up to the management to figure that part out, right? Okay. And say, no, we're not taking that fight. Not happening. Robbie went through, for how many years was it? Two, a two-year run of fighting constantly and beating the baddest dudes on the planet in that weight division at a, at a rate that was unbelievable. Yeah, it was. He, was. he was fighting the baddest dudes and beating people and, and having absolute wars with guys, right? Yeah. You get done doing that, and then he finally gets to the Woodley fight, and I said... I said to uh, Matt Hughes at the time, I said, Matt, make sure he gets out of that first round with Woodley, man, because Tyron is so explosive early on in a fight that he can, he can put anybody away. He's just, I, that's, a, that's a scary, scary man when, it, when he hits you solid or starts hitting doubles on you and stuff. And, uh, you know, Rob didn't make it out of the first round. He got clipped and, and got put away. So that was after that, that run, that mental and physical roller coaster that a guy goes through for each camp and each fight, um, it's, it's very difficult on the mind and the body to do that. He, he's amazing that he pulled it off. Do you want to see him stop fighting? 
No. Okay. No, I wouldn't say that. I'm, I think that the time he's taken off was it's very It's been good, important. yeah. But he changed camp. I mean, he had so much success with ATT, and now it seems like he's with Henry Hoof, a little bit kind of doing his own thing. Henry Hoof's an incredible trainer. Uh, yes. I would say this, that Rob's success came from him maturing and realizing that he needed to go back down to 170. Okay. Could do this at 170. You know, when he came back, when he he was fighting, you know, I was calling his fights in strike force, and I went, Rob, just drop to 170 and go win the damn world title. And, and make millions of dollars and take care of your, your, your family. Yeah. And he goes, I just, I like the test of fighting these bigger guys, Pat. And I go, you're not gonna be a world champ. Nobody's running you over like a truck, but you're not gonna be a world champ. Right. You know, you're walking around at 192 pounds. You can't fight guys that walk around at 225. It just doesn't work very well, you know what I mean? So um, he finally listened, he matured and, and realized he could do it. And he asked, the first fight back in the UFC, I held pads for him in the gym back in Bettendorf. And he asked me to train him, um, and I said, I can't. Huh. I can't do it, dude. I, I just can't. I, I've got broadcasting, I've got this, I've got that. And I'd be doing you a disservice to say that I'm gonna train you. Go somewhere, go to AT&T, AT ATT, and, and get a bunch of good training partners and stuff like that, and, and, and go do it, and he did it, so, yeah. This has been a blast. It really has. I feel like I could talk to you for another two hours, get your take on everything, but unfortunately we are out of time. This is on zero sleep, too. Really? Yeah. Why? Red eye? I got into my hotel about three something in the morning. Three. Gosh, four, where are you coming from? Iowa. Iowa? Yeah, okay. I got delayed uh, forever. Got to the, the airport. Rain. At, landed at Laguardia at two something. Hotel three forty something, and then fell asleep maybe for an hour, and then. So. Gosh, and you've been going all around talking about this fight. Yeah, so I'm. I'm well, you you, you a lot did of not. Coffee, Errol. Yes, a lot um, of I'm so happy that you are a part of this. This is news. I didn't know that you were a part of it. I thought they were just having you. I, kind of... I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to say anything. Oh. Um, until I got out here. Uh, that's you know, great. I didn't, I didn't Congratulations. Thank well deserved. And I think it was so great. You know, again, the sport is still young to where we don't have a lot of retired fighters who don't have ties to the UFC. And that's the one thing. Like I like when I hear from Stan or Kenny Florian. You know, the retired guys because. Okay, well, when it's on Fox, they're kind of working for the UFC. You get my point. But we need more guys like you and Randy Couture, who's doing some stuff with PFL, mm -hmm. because there are no strings attached. Right. And I think you call it like you see it. And you've always done a fantastic job. So I'm really happy that Showtime called your number and that you're going to be a part of it. So it's August 26th. You'll be a part of the broadcast. Are you doing anything leading up to it as well? Um, well, we're going to film tomorrow. Paulie Malinaji and I are oh, going to film sick. tomorrow, breaking down the fight. Great. Uh, do some techniques, things like that, difference in stances, whatever. How, I love that. How to rebuild an MMA fighter into a boxer, so to speak, and then breaking down the particulars of the fight tremendous yeah, well i wish fun. you the best thank, thank you for stopping by you, they're gonna escort you out here the guys are gonna come back in and good yeah. luck yeah that's it right. appreciate it there he is the croatian sensation himself